Who is Jordan Conroy? Who is Jordan Conroy? A person that kind of applies himself, you know, on his work, you know, on and off the field. Someone that tries to, you know, try and put on, put a smile on people's faces. Also a very difficult person at times, you know, who's uh, very sometimes set in his ways. So I'd say I'm a bit of a rainbow with a lot of different colors. What would I say about Jordan? Jordan is the most complicated human being on two feet. He's extremely talented and doesn't realize how talented he is but he has a heart of gold, an absolute heart of gold. Firstly, I called him Jordan because it means flow of life after the River Jordan. Jesus, I didn't know what I was hitting. Jordan was born after my daughter, Jessica, died a cot dead. And I, he was born in Germany, so they were doing tests. Um, I signed up for studies of cot dead and they were monitoring hearts. And I remember he was in the hospital. <laughs> they had him on a heart machine, the machine kept going off. I was going, Jesus Christ, what am I doing wrong here? So <laughs> the heart surgeon came down and he said, he looked at it and he readjusted it. And my son was only three months old and he said, your son's going to be a sportsman. I said, well, what are you on about? He said, his heart, his heart is beating slower than a normal person. That's a sportsman's heart. And I went, yeah, right. Oh, Jesus Christ, how right he was. And Jordan didn't get up and walk at nine months. Jordan ran, no, literally he ran. My first memories of Jordan, I suppose, were in Tullamore College, where I was a teacher, I was involved in sport, and uh, one of the things we had annually was county sports, where all the schools in Offaly competed against each other. Jordan was a little first year, and uh, he was picked by the PE teacher to take part in the athletic events. Now, the rule was at the time you could take part in two field events, or two events, plus a relay. So, Jordan took part in the 100 metres and 200 metres, and the relay and so it was 12 points. There was four points for a win, so we were guaranteed 12 points. Like, he destroyed everyone. We, did, we knew he was fast, but we didn't realise how fast he was. There I am. We knew he had huge potential. Now, we didn't realise at the time, I suppose, how huge it was. Now, he joined Tullamore Harriers for a while, I think, but his main athletic were with the school. I went to the local club, the Harriers, and he started running. He was the sprint champion, long jump champion, and hurdle champion of Ireland. I remember um, <laughs> that trailing hand was always an issue with my coach. He just said, I'm always dragging it backwards like this. Put me off balance. I understand now, but back then I didn't have a clue what he's talking about. Sometimes we trained on the bog. I'd get him to jump the, the bog drains to get the sprint on him because it was soft. He was very good at that. We'd take turns, I'd fall in, he'd get over it. Then we would, you know, Hurdles, we just put sticks in the ground, he'd jump over them. It was a lot of training. I was like one of those little freaks in school that did everything and was good at everything to do with sports that could, you know, keep going. And geez, I miss that now because <laughs> it's tougher to do, keep fit now than it is back then. He was very good at soccer. He loved soccer. He adored Terry Henry. Um, I think he taught at one stage Terry was his father. That was my next venture after I decided, I think, to quit athletics. Um, yeah, quite enjoyed that stint, probably. You know, the next dream was to play for Ireland, <laughs> which was funny, because I never did. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but something always told me he's meant for more. I've taken him from this fantastic setup, I have to get him, but I always knew it wasn't right. You grew up in Germany. How many years did you spend in Germany? Born there in 1994. And I think I spent 10 years of my uh, childhood there. A lot different to, uh, you know, to the Irish kind of culture. So, yeah, I mean, I, sp I suppose I was very lucky there that I got to pick up sports. 
and yeah like from a sporting aspect uh you know i enjoyed all of it it was it was pretty fun I wasn't always like the easiest uh child in germany i was a bit i was a bit of a wild child got into a lot of trouble i was uh very shaky uh a very <laughs> angry child and when you reflect now where was the anger coming from it's just funny kind of seeing it from an adult now that it, it's just so blatant obvious where all this kind of um built up anger and these um these tantrums and these outbursts came because obviously in Germany, it wasn't always, you know, the greatest of times growing up there. Um, like me, I was a child of domestic abuse. And um, I just kind of remember, you know, something that I've locked away for so long in my life. Um, and it was just kind of now that as I got older, you start to kind of think about it. And it's just kind of, it kind of makes sense now why I was the child I was, because I didn't know, you know, watching you know your mother getting physically abused beaten at such a young age you just don't know what to do because you know i just felt so helpless at those times you know kind of looking at that little boy he it was either fight or flight but i could never fight it was always running away trying to find help it's something that i carried with me like for life and the reason then i became so troublesome in school was because of that you know and um, seeing like my uh, a stepdad. He, it wasn't my. It wasn't my biological father. Did it. it was like a stepfather. So you know, I grew up with a lot of you know hatred as well. At like five, six years of age, and I just kind of, you know, transferred that hatred onto the people you know outside of that. I suppose that was my coping mechanism, and uh, it was probably a very toxic one. But God forbid, like you know, I was a child. I didn't know what I was doing. I blame myself for it, and I think the biggest part of it is the guilt I carry that I didn't see what it was doing to him. And I carry that guilt for so long and it's like the heaviest, like 10 bales of briquettes inside me. And I walked and walked and it never got lighter. And I remember one incident many, many moons ago, I was going down to pick him up from school and I had separated from my ex-husband and Jordan was down doing something in the Irish Kessner in Germany and I was walking down to pick him up but my husband, ex-husband came down after me and Jordan was running out of school running up to me and my husband got out, ex-husband got out and started screaming and roaring at me over something because I had walked away and he started beating me on the street and I always remember Jordan screaming, just screaming and getting up and running away and he was helpless. Yeah, sometimes kind of hated myself for that because I just didn't, I, I hated leaving her in such a situation, but I knew it was the thing that I had to do to try and save her. Um, and if that was like crying for help upstairs to neighbors, it was a lot, it was a lot of, uh, you know, knocking on doors to neighbors, trying to, to call the police because, you know, the fear I had inside me was just like, you know, kind of thinking back, it just, it was so horrible. And you carry along that burden with you for a long time. But I never looked at what it did to him. I never seen it because I was so caught up in my closed area, my closed curtains. And he's always been protective of me. Always been very protective of me. And it's funny, sometimes we, we don't talk about it much. I don't know why. He, he once talked to me about it and his perspective it was slightly different. And it was amazing to see that the child sees it so differently. And I think that's what's very important, that people see children live it too, and children carry it within them differently than we do. I suppose in one respect, you look back at it as a child and you're looking down at the child, like he's a big, tall, grown man. And he's looking back at that little, little boy who was helpless and who couldn't help me or couldn't do anything and was so silent with it all. And now this big, strong, tall Jordan is looking back at little Jordan. And I wonder what big, tall Jordan is saying to little Jordan. All I can really remember is, you know, those sleepless nights of waking up to, you know, arguing and your mother screaming um, and you just can hear like, you know, 
like you can hear punches, you can hear slaps, and then you just kind of get out of bed and you're just peeping through a door. And, you know, you kind of have to look at your mom to say, do I need to get help or do I, you know, stay here? And it's just something that happened freak more frequent and more frequent. And, you know, it was just like, it became such second nature to me to like, just try and run away and get help. Or the odd time I did try and, you know, fight um, was like, you know, it, it happened at nighttime and then it happened during the day, you know, having to see your mom get, you know, slapped in the face and you're just kind of standing there and then she's just there silent, trying not to cry in front of your children, trying to stay strong um, to like days where he's just pulling her hair and everything. And I remember I just had to try, you know, I just wanted to help so badly that I bit him in the back of his eyes, trying to just like, you know, get him away from her. And, you know, it just anything I ever did never worked. Um, and it was just, I suppose, that was so frustrating for me as a child, not being able to protect your mother. You know, that's all you wanted to do was kind of protect your mom, but you felt so helpless. And I think all those things just kind of built up in me, built up in me and made me such an angry child. But what I would say to little Jordan is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to have put you through it. I thought you didn't see what was going on, but you did. And I think that's what we have to realize. Children experience it different and they deal with it differently. And I think as a child, they see someone they love getting hurt and they don't know what to do. And he went silent. He never caused any trouble. And now big, strong Jordan probably looks back at it. And he should be proud of that little boy. He's looking back down them because that little boy made the Jordan that's looking down on that little boy. And that little boy was the bravest little boy in two feet. And that night he came in to protect me. He did. And that little boy never complained. He never complained. He never asked me for any more than I could give. And I think that's the blessing in the skies. And the big tall Jordan, he should be so proud of who he is because he has a gift. He has a gift of understanding and he has a gift now to bring forward that perhaps I think sometimes children are the silent sufferers of domestic violence because a lot of it is on the woman and we bear the bruises and we bear the broken bones and the financial. And I think children are the silent sufferers because they don't choose to come into it, we bring them into it. And I think that has helped him grow into the wonderful, wonderful person that he is. I wish I could take that little boy. If I had a choice, I would pick up little Jordan and just tell him I'm sorry. My mom had to try and figure something out, um, you know, because she knew that what was happening to her, you know, was affecting your, her kids. I also had a little sister at the time and she was seeing all that, seeing her dad hit her mother. She was seeing how much it was affecting me, especially because, you know, at the time, like I was the man of the house at bloody seven years old, trying to protect, you know, from an adult. I just don't know how I did it. Um, don't know how my mother did it. When you think about it as an adult, how psychologically and physically, you know, dominant he was over her, that he had his nails stuck into her so deep that, you know, I can see why she couldn't leave. You know, he had such control over her and he also threatened, you know, to take my sister away from her. So obviously, like, you know, she had so many things to deal with. She tried to protect me, she tried to protect my sister, tried to protect herself, tried to protect him from us. As much as I suffered, you know, she suffered a lot more as well. And for her to be able to finally take us away from that situation and bring us over to Ireland must have taken a hell of a lot of, you know, you know, willpower, a lot of, you know, bravery, a lot of bravery. And I often wonder, I don't mean to sound cliche, but I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have sports to try, you know, and take me away from that because it could have easily gone south so bloody fast with me because, you know, I wasn't getting out of those, you know, those little rages of anger and everything. It was due to sports, being able to take my mind off things and being able 
to surround myself in an environment that I actually enjoyed, that I could excel in something. So I was very lucky to have sports for me there to kind of, you know, help me through that as cheesy as it sounds, but it was also a lifesaver for me to put my mind at ease as a boy or as men in general. You know, we just didn't really talk about emotions or feelings in a way. Um, the way only people would know is, is how I acted and how I, you know, kind of behaved as a child. But I just, yeah, I didn't really talk about it at all to anyone. I suppose the, the, the experiences were so traumatic and took a toll on me that, you know, the most natural thing for me to do was to bury it as deep as I could in the back of my head. Just the helplessness, I suppose, I took personally because I just felt so useless at times. Because um, I remember like we were walking home and he was just there out of nowhere, like in the middle of the road at night. And, you know, I just could feel myself just locking up in fear, like shaking. It's like, oh, what's he going to do now? How did you get out? I don't know what the details, but I just remember it was very sudden, very fast. Um, she literally packed two suitcases. Um, I think she called my auntie saying, could she stay in horse for a while till she gets on her feet? She said, right, we're going. And I remember kept as quiet as much as we could. Um, even before all that, I think the last show is when he had another child with another woman while trying to, you know, keep control of her. All of that was going in, on in, you know, in the background where she said, right, I've had enough, you know, I need to get out of here. I need to go back and reset. And I just remember having two, three suitcases and, you know, my friend Aaron's mother, like we were great friends with dropping us to the airport. And um, I just remember crying at the gate because I had to leave all my friends that I had. And I was going to a different country that I really didn't know anyone. And I remember getting picked up by my auntie and then driven down to Tullamore up in Clemmage and entering the house. And yeah, I just remember, you know, my cousins, you know, making me laugh and giggle and pulling faces. And, you know, I suppose that's where my new life began. When we came back home, we left Germany. It took a long time to get out of Germany, the court cases and that, and then the judge ruled I could leave. We came back to Ireland and we had three bags. Three bags, his clothes, my clothes. And I made a mistake and I left my daughter's clothes behind and we brought back our bag of toys. We stayed um, with a sister of mine in a box room, the three of us. Jordan and his sister slept top and tail and I slept on the floor. Um, never complained never complained. We moved so many times that we're dizzy. We've had very little, very little. I had very little. If it wasn't for St. Vincent de Paul many times, I don't know how I would have put the ESB or heat at the house. But what people don't see, he never complained. Jordan never complained. Well, it wasn't then simply a case of getting out of Germany, landing in Tullamore and relief all round we're free to move on with our lives. What's gone on over the previous decade to you, your sister, to your mom is, is there in the background. Your mom is, you know, obviously, a, you know, an incredibly incredible woman to have come through that, to survive that. And the way she's spoken about it and, and about you, you know, she speaks about the guilt that she has suffered. How's your relationship been with her? Yeah, it's been good, like it's been strong. I mean, we only really had each other <laughs> from Jeremy to all the way to here and growing up, you know, and she, she was like the rock for the both of us. You know, she had to play both roles of mom and dad and everything. And, you know, she did exceptionally well to take us out from that situation, to bring us to Ireland, to you know, start new again, to live in an apartment, you know, to work in two jobs to making sure, you know, at those early years that we got everything we wanted for Christmas. I mean, she did uh, an amazing job and I only really can think of how amazing job it she did as an adult because I know being a parent is not an easy job. And you know, to, to all like single mothers or single dads, you know, who are doing it, you know, and trying their best, you know, fair play because, you know, having to do 
to, if it's taking care of one kid or two kids, like, you know, and to be able to, you know, see them growing up to be able to achieve things like that, you know, it, it must be rewarding. And, you know, I suppose, you know, I use sports in a way of to say thank you, because obviously I wasn't able to communicate that with her throughout the years at all, you know. So through my sports, it was just kind of to say, like, you know, a big thank you. And, you know, if you didn't take us out of this situation, I wouldn't have been able to be here and achieve this and do this and do that. Sports seems to have been a real constant in your life, even through the very difficult days, a love of athletics, through to coming to Ireland and continuing with that, playing a bit of football, playing a bit of rugby. Was there ever any period through all this where sport dropped off? Yeah, I suppose like, you know, sports was a big coping mechanism for me uh, without knowing. Um, so I suppose, you know, when think about it from when I went from athletics to football and I came over here, did the hurling, Gaelic, soccer, athletics, and then back into soccer, it was, you know, when I finished the soccer, like 17, 18, and, um, you know, I failed, you know, of becoming a soccer player because I really wanted to play for Ireland and there and, you know, the pathway just got cut off. I was just kind of sitting there thinking, oh, wow, you know, what am I going to do now? Like, you know, where is my goal going to be next, you know, in sports? And I literally just sat down and I looked and I was just like, I've done Gaelic, I've done the soccer, I've done hurling, I've done the athletics and I've all fallen out of love with those. So I was just kind of sitting around to say, well, now I don't have a sport anymore. It's interesting because Allianz with their Stop the Drop initiative, one of the main areas where boys and girls drop out of sport is that transition from primary school to secondary. You start looking at other parts of your life, there's maybe more of a draw on the weekend. That was the period then for you as well. Basically, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think like, I think I was different because I was, I was so competitive. I was so like, you know, I actually wanted to make myself so I wanted to make myself something out of so, out of any sport. And when I didn't have that in line anymore, I was just kind of like, well, what's the point? It doesn't always have to be like from competitive, but from the social aspect of it, you know? Um, yes, it can be daunting entering a new club, but I've done it plenty of time. I've joined plenty of new teams, like, and had to make myself known um, and kind of get to know the last. But like, once you're kind of in that circle and community, it's like probably one of the best things that can happen. And then he started dabbling in Tullamore College in the rugby. <laughs> and a big lobe to that would be Dinny Magner. And the lads all played rugby and they were all in Jordan's class. And you say, ah, Jordan, come on, come out and give us a hand. Now he hadn't a clue what he was doing. Well, we were trying to persuade him because of his pace to play rugby in the school. And Jordan would say, ah, yeah, I'll come out, I'll come out. But he never turned up. Next thing, about three weeks before we were playing the semi-final, without being asked, Lo and behold, who appeared out training but Jordan. And he was extremely impressive. Like all you had to do was give him the ball and he was gone. In the semi-final, we couldn't play him, to be fair, to the other lads on the team who were training the whole time. But we brought him on at half time and he didn't do anything extraordinary. But we took the chance of picking him for the final against Oaklands. And that final was played up in Newbridge College grounds. And I'd say for the first 20 minutes, there were two very well balanced teams and they ran at one another, but neither team was able to break through. And eventually, after about 20 minutes, Oakland decided to kick the ball down the pitch. Jordan caught it, and he did the greatest beeline, kind of semicircular beeline from the right wing across the left, in under the post, scored a try. Again, 10 minutes later, he repeated it. And all of a sudden, we were 14 points up. Oaklands were on the back foot. They were afraid to kick, they had no plan B and we eventually ran out easy winners. So that was the start of his rugby career. And I'd say he decided then, maybe this game is for me. And I remember one day the ball was kicked and it landed in his hands. And I remember looking at me and I just went, Lauf, Jordan, Lauf. And that's what I usually shout is Lauf, Jordan, Lauf. And off he went. He needed it, Jordan just needed it. I knew he had a little gift. And I kept thinking, I've taken his gift and I've put it in a box and I've taken it away from the world because of my choices. And I said, now I have to get this gift out. I received advice that, you know, maybe 
the rugby world would be better for him. And at that same time, he'd been doing a bit of tag rugby up in Tullamore. And the captain of the team came up to him and just said, you're going to play rugby. And he said, Ma, what do you think I do? And I said, you know what, Jordo, go on, just do it. And then it started progressing from there. Where is the bit that this Jordan Conroy starts to emerge? It was after school, the leaving cert. I don't know, when I turned 18, 19, and I know it sounds so cheating, but so when I started the rugby, you no, know, I started to enter a community where I've had, I suppose, older teammates who were like, you know, eight, 10 years older than me. Um, as you would say, we call it a brotherhood, but like, if you think about it, you know, they would not be as much father figures, but they were good male figures to have in my life. And, you know, being able to see that and see, you know, them kind of passing on things to you and teaching you that only really men can do because my mom did an exceptional job, but at the end of the day, you know, certain things, you know, only men know about ourselves. And it's just kind of like, when I got that knowledge passed on to me and it was more so like guidance. It's finally, I got the guidance, you know, from my teammates at a very young age when I was 18, when I first joined this club, it was like the guidance I got that kind of slowly started to like shape and mold who I, who I became today. But he was in good hands, yes they were. I think it's the first time really, if you think about it, athletics is a very isolated sport. And then the soccer, again, it's, it's not, soccer is not as family orientated as rugby. And I think you hit, you hit it there. When he got in there, they, they were like just big, big, big teddy bears wrapping their arms around him. And I think it was very new to him. And I think he loved it. He nurtured it. And they genuinely praised him. I never said, John, you're the fastest or you're the best. I always believed in hard work. You're only as good as your last game. But Tullamore Rugby Club nurtured Jordan and they planted the seed that has blossomed into this magnificent, what could we call Jordan? We couldn't call him a flower, but sure, we'll call him a big old oak tree. John had a great allegiance to the club here. He rang me and he said, can I have a chat with you? And he told me the story that Buccaneers were on Tim. We were a junior club, they were a senior club. And we said, Jordan, we won't hold you back. If you went to play senior rugby, you're dead right if you had to go places. So Jordan joined Buccaneers. And in the space of two years, he was the leading try scorer each year for two or three years. And then Connacht picked him up. He was on the Connacht 15 aside, but wasn't too long on the Connacht 15 aside when uh, the other seven stepped in. And the rest is history, really. You're heading back to a, a second Olympic Games. The steps along the way and actually going from having a bit of crack with your mates, playing a bit of tag rugby to going, all right, actually, I am good at this. I can make a career out of this. How does that go? Starting the sevens, it was, um, you know, what I'd known from it, it was like a social event, you know, like we had a sevens tournament where I was introduced to it and I was just like, yeah, this is like, this is class. You know, you have all these teams, you're playing big white pitch and you have like music and a party afterwards. So I was kind of thinking, oh yeah, this is not bad. And then... You know, obviously, still being like a 15s player, I didn't take much notice of it. Um, but then, like, the sevens program, you know, was born. And obviously, after playing a couple of tournaments here and there, like, my mom was like, you know, this is, the sport can be for you as well. You know, you can really, um, you know, showcase your speed here. You have more room and all this. And I was like, yeah, maybe. I don't know. You know, first of all, I didn't think I was good enough, you know, because I had lads who were here you know, uh, from the academies and everything. And obviously my skills weren't up to scratch and everything. So I was like really nervous kind of entering that time period where, you know, I had to really work hard to kind of catch up to these ta to these lads. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad I did have that because I had, you know, a goal I set myself. I need to be on par with them to be able to get picked. And I just remember, you know, like, the in and the out learning about the game, I was like, oh wow, yeah, you know, this is this is cool, you know, this is cool and I like these lads and again, like I was kind of forming a new bond with these lads up in Dublin and getting to know them and it was just kind of went from one thing to another to like, you know, when the sevens picked up, I went to a new club in Buccaneers and, you know, did really well there and having those two kind of things together molded me into like a proper room player and I was still a bit off the mark, but, um, yeah, it was, that's when I started seeing progression. I was like, oh, right, okay, cool. From that moment on, it just went boom.
I got to hug out for Ireland in the Dubai Invitational Center for the first time ever in um, you know, 2017 and then playing rugby Europe and it was just from that it was just you know as you were building towards you know a new goal and like we were just you know we're achieving and achieving we're always looking to achieve. I remember the first time I seen him in the Ireland jersey. Um, I never went to see any of his games because I, I couldn't afford it and as I said his first time he was playing in Exeter in, in England. I remember running into the stadium and looking over and here's my Jordan flying down the pitch in a green jersey and I couldn't believe it. And for a country that started sevens late, like all the other Fiji and New Zealand and Australia and England were playing sevens and in a professional capacity long before. Ireland started off sevens in a, as amateurs then and so they were out of their depth for the first couple of years but they've, if you're talking about progress and you graph progress of the different teams Ireland would be way up there compared to the others. Your impact with the team and the team's impact in general in sevens rugby is just growing and growing. You know, the constant travelling around the world seems to be something you're very used to at this stage. Uh, the competing at the very highest level, gone from a stage of uh, going and, and not being one of the also rounds, but actually going now with an expectation of, you know, we should be looking to win medals here. Yeah, yeah, and and that and that's what we take pride in. As you said, you know, at the beginning it was all so new. You know, it was like traveling the world. It's like, oh, you're going to see this place, you're going to see that place, and that was the exciting part. And going through the years, we actually were able to like build ourselves as a team, gain that experience, and you know, and and starting to become a threat. And within the last year, that's what happened. You know, I think after the Olympics, we realized, you know, being able to qualify for the Tokyo Olympics. We deserve, you know, to be a team on the World Series where we can be a massive threat. And I mean, I think this year that's happened for us. You know, we've gelled and we know each other as individual players and as a team that, you know, yes, we are a force to be reckoned with. This time around the Olympics, I think we're going to enjoy so much better, you know, uh, because we have our friends and family. It's an hour away. Full experience of the Athletes Village. The full experience of the, you know, Athletes Village, because like it honestly, in Tokyo, it felt like a bloody prison, like no one... Everyone was just kind of going at different times. Like no one could see their faces. Everyone was keeping 10 meters away from each other. We were eating like with the bloody perspex glass in front of it. It felt like prison and you were just talking to someone. So being able to have that freedom and just being able to relax and just take it in, that's going to be like really enjoyable. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I think that's what was taken away from us in Tokyo, that part of it. But again, it was just such a weird time because we qualified like two weeks before we were, or like before we we're heading off to Tokyo. So having done that and then celebrating that, but then having to turn on again, being like, try and win a goal, you're like, oh, what? And then having to come out there, you're like, you're, you're seven hours getting through, like, I don't know, security from getting off the plane to getting onto the bus and then getting to the Olympic Village. And you're just kind of like, oh man, this stinks, you know, this stinks. Yeah, really looking forward to being able to kind of get that sense of it, you know, and being able to enjoy that aspect of the Olympic Games. So, yeah. Your mom got her ticket sorted? Oh, she did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think she she did. It's been a heck of a journey, I think it's fair to say, to, to get to this stage. Uh, thanks so much for being so open and so honest. And I think, you know, it's really powerful stuff. A lot of people will take an awful lot from it. Uh, fair play, Jordan. Uh, thanks very much. I think I can help. It's just that. Uh, no, good to get the story out there because at the end of the day, we're all human, you know, and we all have our struggles in life. And, you know, if you can just shine something on that to be, you know, to kind of say you're not alone in things like, you know, people do suffer. And it's just important to try and have good people around you. And, you know, if people don't have that, that's kind of, you know, where you want to try and solve the problem because I suppose being able to talk about these things earlier on, the younger you are, it's better. And um, because I only really sh figured out the benefits of what it is to be able to open up and um, how, like how good it is for you. Because sometimes when I talk, like, it just lifts the weight off me, you know, and it kind of clears my headspace as well. Because um, sometimes when you just overthink, it creates a lot of unwanted anxiety, and that's such a dangerous thing. And it could affect your mood and that's what I've learned now as well because like you know it's just 
it's just such an important tool to be able to to be able to share your experience to help others and that's probably the main thing what i want to do you know is be able to help others through my experiences in the future i remember one conversation we had and i remember we were saying who would he have been if we had stayed in germany who would jordan have been and he said i wouldn't be who i am now mommy and i said what do you think? And I believe in your pathways in life. And you take your path and a gate or a stone might be there. You walk around it, you climb over it and you take what, what comes in your way. You just take what comes and you accept and you keep going. And I remember him saying, he's glad he's in Ireland and he's glad he's here. And I look at him now and from the little skull with the plaits in his hair and the dust flying from his feet to this amazing man and I think Jordan has a wonderful smile he's a wonderful smile and he has a way of reaching to people and I'm so proud of him I never thought I never thought he'd become this I never did and if God was to take me in the morning I think I would rest in peace because I feel my guilt has lifted and he's blossomed and I have no longer I didn't damage him like I thought I did and I think he's learned and he's found his wings and he's flying very very high and whatever way the wind brings him he'll be okay because I'll always be there to catch